Okay, so welcome to the business case for prizes discussion. Uh, my name is Kareem Makani. Um, I'm at the Harvard Business School and I also um, run the NASA Tournament Labs. And we've got a great session of um, folks who've actually been both uh, uh, organizing prizes uh, from uh, the private sector and the government sector, as well as uh, folks that have actually won uh, prizes. So we get a sense of what the what the people are that are behind all these great, um, uh, great uh, uh, results that we sort of see in the prize space uh, world. Uh, and the plan is that we're going to uh, each take about 15 minutes. I'll first frame up the case for this um, and how to sort of think about prizes uh, uh, from an innovation point of view. Uh, and then after that, um, each of the presenters will take 15 minutes and talk about what they've done. Um, and then we'll have a Q&A. Um, so we have two hours, uh, lots of time for us to ask a lot of questions and to, uh, and to make sense of uh, how uh, prizes are being thought about, uh, both from an academic perspective, but also from a real life, practical, let's get this done uh, point of view. So if I could have the uh, presentation up, that'd be great. And the speakers we have actually are, are quite uh, impressive. Uh, we have Chris Frangioni, who is the Director for Energy, Environment, and Prize Development for XPRIZE Foundation. Um, and then we have one of the winners from their Wendy Schmidt Oil Cleanup Prize, uh, Stuart Ellis, who is um, at Elastic American Marine. They won the challenge. Um, and they got a 4X improvement in performance from industry standards uh, for oil spill cleanup. So we'll see that. Uh, then we'll have uh, my good uh, colleague, Jeff Davis, uh, Dr. Jeff Davis, uh, who is the head of space life sciences at NASA. Uh, and was one of the key vectors into NASA to think about prizes at the operational level for NASA. And he'll talk about his experience running prizes uh, for NASA. And then we'll have a winner uh, for one of the uh, one of the challenges that, that, that Jeff ran, uh, Bruce Cragen, uh, who developed a new algorithm for data-driven solar forecasting. So we'll have a very good set of uh, individuals talking about their experiences with prizes. Um, so, uh, so I'm going to bore you with some theory, but it's important to sort of put this all into context and understand why uh, we have prizes and what, what they do and how they operate. Um, and to some degree, we're sort of back to the future. Uh, prizes were the main uh, approach used by governments and agencies uh, uh, for, for a long period of time until sort of the late 19th century. Um, 18th century, when the modern corporation showed up and the modern university showed up, um, and R&D and research and development and innovation got internalized within the modern university and the modern corporation. So, you know, uh, GE, Siemens, and so on set up their own labs to do, to do research uh, and to innovate. Uh, and universities also said we we're going to actually invest in research by setting up formal departments for engineering and science and so on and to drive that forward. Um, and it's been about the last 15 years that we've sort of seen a modern resurgence of the prizes as, 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 a, as a means to solve innovation problems. Um, and the logic is, um, uh, uh, actually I'm going to skip this and I just want to shoot, I might have the wrong uh, uh, slides up. Yeah, we'll start with here. So when we think about innovation, the thing that is it's clear when we're innovating, when we're, when we're doing anything new, is the sheer amount of uncertainty that we're faced with. So this is the Time Magazine cover uh, talking about uh, uh, you know, the, the great work that uh, Kettering did uh, for innovation. So Kettering was the chief science and chief technology officer at General Motors. Uh, and him and uh, uh, Alfred Sloan established a m modern corporation. Um, and Kettering sort of you know, like Steve Jobs uh, uh, was a man of the year on time and was, was celebrated as a great innovator and he had amazing innovations. So the electric starter motor, Freon gas, uh, you know, ethyl gasoline and so forth, all those elements were developed by Kettering and, and his folks. Uh, he has 186 patents under his name. And in testimony to Congress, um, he um, uh, emphasize the fact that when it comes to innovation, there's three big problems. Uh, the first is, uh, the slides look fuzzy. <laughs> uh, are you guys trying to fix that? Okay, great. Um, uh, the first is, when he comes to R&D, he says, you don't know when you're going to get the thing, whether it's going to work or not, and whether it's going to have any value whatsoever. 
So, so this notion of like we just don't know if it's ever going to work. When we when we when we go after R and D, when we go after innovation, when we go after something new, there's just fundamental uncertainty about what's going to happen at the end. Uh, and organizations need to figure out a way to deal with this sort of uncertainty, uh, and and to and to and to and to tackle it. Uh, Secondly, uh, as, as, um, as um, uh, uh, Tom mentioned in, this, in the speech, uh, Joy's Law also haunts innovation efforts as well. And this perspective is basically, uh, you know, the fact is that in any domain uh, of endeavor, no matter, you know, who you are, what you do, there's a lot more smart people working outside of your organization than inside your organization. Um, now, this is always anathema to folks at the Harvard Business School and the executives that come for exec ed because they think that they can hire the best people, that you can actually, in fact, hire the best folks from anywhere in the world. Um, uh, but in fact, uh, in, in um, study after study, in, uh, in experience after experience, sort of trying to find the best people inside the organization is always a tough, tough problem. Um, the final thing is uh, that we're faced with is that our models for organizing innovation themselves are changing dramatically. Um, and, and this change has, has, been, has been quite spectacular in the last uh, 15 years or so as well. Um, so if you were to sort of think about uh, 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 how people used to access knowledge before. So how many of you had Encyclopedia Britannica in your homes growing up, right? Um, and how many of you have bought Britannica for your kids or your nephews and nieces? Two. The rest of you are just bad parents, right? I mean, what? Uh, your, 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 your parents invested all this money, right? Bought the $2,000 set, uh, and now you're not doing that for your own kids? Yeah. So what's happened is, what happened to, to Britannica was that Encarta showed up. Um, Encarta showed up, and it uh, changed the distribution model for, uh, for knowledge. So before, Britannica's model was based on door-to-door -door salesmen selling books. Uh, and that's why they could get all this high margin on, on these products. Um, and you know, Bill Gates comes in with Encarta and says, no, we can sell this at Best Buy, and we can distribute this through plastic CDs. Um, and that perspective completely upended the business model for, for Britannica. And that basically started a big decline. Um, at the same time, um, uh, in 2001, uh, you know, Wikipedia came back, uh, came online. Uh, and how many of you used Wikipedia in the last week? Yeah, so you've, anybody used Britannica to, or Encarta? Okay. Yeah, so Wikipedia did two things. One, it naturally moved the distribution model away from, from CDs and plastic to the web, which is the natural evolution that you would expect anybody to do. And in fact, Britannica also moved to the web and so did Encarta. Uh, but fundamentally, it changed the production model as well. So prior to, uh, 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 to Wikipedia, the way we thought the best way to organize for innovation was, uh, or for even for, for, for sort of collection of knowledge, was to get smart people. So Britannica would hire academics. They would define the topics that needed to be worked on. Then they would hire their buddies to go and go ahead and write those articles. And then it would take a while for those articles to come back and then they would be compiled together and edited and pr proofread and so on, and then you would go ahead and sell the books. Jimmy Wells comes about and sort of says, no, in fact, I think anybody in the world can both suggest a topic uh, for Wikipedia um, as well as contribute to it. And you can contribute in any way you want. So you could go there and if you're a grammar nut, you can be part of the grammar police on Wikipedia and simply fix grammar on articles. Um, you could care a lot about the Red Sox and write the Red Sox entry, or you could care about something else and, and start that entry up. Um, but Wikipedia basically showed that a bottoms-up process could be as effective as a top-down process. And in fact, it was so effective that it has basically put Britannica and Encarta out of business. Now, you would say, well, great, this is a one-off case study, right? You know, Britannica and encyclopedias and so forth was just a one-off thing. But we've also seen the same thing happen in the world of software. So open source software communities, when they came online um, in the late 80s, early 90s, were again viewed with a skepticism. We'd never thought that software could be developed in this highly distributed bottoms-up process. 
Um, and now we have a situation where a lot of the key innovations that we sort of see happen in the world of software comes through the open source communities. And firms like IBM, the largest patenter in the world, also is the biggest investor in open source communities as well. And what we're seeing is a sea change in, in thinking about how to organize innovation itself. And prizes and contests are a way into thinking about uh, the, the fundamental ways in which you may organize for innovation. Um, so study after study has sort of shown um, that when it comes to innovation, there's two major tasks that we, that we deal with. One is the generation of ideas, and the second is the selection of ideas. And you need to be good at both. You need to generate a bunch of ideas, and you need to be able to select amongst those ideas. And those are both knowledge-intensive tasks. And what we've sort of seen is that in order for you to succeed with innovation, you need to have lots of ideas and lots of different ideas. Um, and you have to sort of funnel, you have to create an innovation funnel that, that can accept this diversity and quantity of ideas. And in most settings, um, uh, firms are underpowered when it comes to both the number and the diversity of ideas that come through. I think I have the wrong set of slides up here. This, they look similar, so I'll see how far I get and I might go up and, and do a change. So the thing that happens is um, when we think about innovation um, is that uh, we have to actually move to a setting where um, where we care about extreme values and we care about statistics in terms of innovation. So I can just take a very sparse view of innovation. There's a lot of myth and ceremony about how to innovate, the culture of innovation, and so on. But from a very bare bones perspective, uh, innovation can be seen as a, as a numbers game. It's a, it's a statistical game, which is based on the number of trials you make. So any kind of a process that you do in statistics, so if you remember back in Stats 101 in college, um, if you think of an underlying distribution, uh, the first time you do something, the first time you'll ever do something, you'll just get the average value, which is here. So the value of innovation outcome could be anything you care about. It could be market share, it could be performance, you name it. It could be any, any value that you care about. But the first time you do something yourself, you'll just get the average value. And it's only through multiple trials multiple independent trials will you see the entire distribution and you'll get the, the, the most high performing value at the end. And so what this says is that for most organizations when they do an innovation task, they'll typically just have one team or one person or one, one part of the organization go after it. And statistics would tell us that what you'll get is the average value. Now, you might think, well, we're special as a company, right? And you know, our, our distribution is different than this distribution, and we might be more right-shifted. Maybe. Uh, but also, if you believe in statistics, then we know that there's also sort of reversion to the mean, and that people show up to the mean in the end. So no matter, again, if you sort of think about Joy's Law, no matter how smart you are, you will still basically, if you just do it once, you'll end up with average results. And you, you need to find a mechanism that allows you to access these extreme values at a cost-effective way. So I'm going to go back and switch out the presentation, so we're the right presentation. Okay. Well, So, so this, this statistical view is actually kind of scary uh, because if you believe in statistics and you believe in the fact that in the end innovation is a numbers game, then most organizations are woefully underpowered uh, in playing the innovation game. And the reason why we sort of see um, a lot of failure with innovation, a lot, a lot of failure in startups is that basically what's happening is that they're basically recreating uh, the, uh, the distribution in the economy. Um, and only one startup basically in the end uh, ends, up, ends up winning, okay? Um, so I'm gonna go further and sort of say, if you believe in this approach, then there's actually uh, a new logic for organizing innovation that contests provide. So the traditional logic um, is one 
uh, around internal development. And so this is your, I do a lot of work with software, so this is sort of the prototypical software developer working away in, in, your, in the Bowser of your IT department. Um, and um, you know, so the, the, the typical logic for internal development is as follows. Um, you'll define the problem. You'll say, okay, we gotta go solve a problem. We're gonna create a new algorithm, we're gonna create a new software system to help us solve this problem. Um, then you're gonna work pretty hard to find the right workers. You're going to go out there and say, i got to find the right experts in this space or in this problem and make sure that they actually come work for me. Then you're going to incentivize the effort. You're going to go out there and say, I'm going to give you lots of money. If you're a private company, I'll give you stock options because we need the, these skills in our organization. Um, then you will monitor the effort. You're going to make sure that they're not slacking, right? They're actually working. You're going to give them time cards. You're going to do reviews and all those kinds of things that's going to monitor their effort. Uh, this, is lots of, this is what managers do a lot of time. Um, and then, of course, what's going to happen is that they'll hit failures. They'll be, you know, uh, downtrodden because it didn't work out. And so then you as a manager will then have to basically energize the workers, right? And go, rah, 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 please keep working away this problem. We've got we to gotta find a solution for this. Um, and then, of course, uh, what happens often is that you'll end up redefining the problem as well. Because what you'll do is you'll say, well, given the problem as we thought about it to now, you know, we don't have the right skills or abilities for us to solve this problem, so let's redefine it. Um, then you'll set up an evaluation criteria uh, to, to, to look at the results. Um, and then in the end, you will pray for performance, right? You'll say, I hope this damn thing works. Right? We've spent all this time, all this budget, right? all this effort, and I just hope it works. Uh, and this is the way we organize ourselves in, in, in most settings when it comes to internal development. Um, the logic for a contest is very different and is actually runs counter to how we think about uh, what the best way to organize is. The first thing you do, again, is define the problem. You will spend a lot of time defining the problem. But now, um, you also have to develop the criteria for evaluation. And this is going to actually force you to be actually very clear about what the problem is that you're trying to solve. When you're doing internal development, what happens is that the problem and the solution co-develop themselves and, and, and really push the boundaries uh, of, of sort of saying, what can be done given what we know? When you step back and sort of say, I need to define the problem by myself and then develop a criteria for evaluation, then basically you are now changing the way you approach problem solving. You are not thinking about the ways in which a solution can be developed. You are thinking more and more about what the problem should be and fundamentally what the problem is and what will satisfy you and your organization in terms of a solution. Um, then you'll set a prize, right? You'll say, okay, it's, this is worth X dollars for me. Um, then solvers will self-select uh, and try to compete to solve the problem. Now what's interesting here is that the solvers are self-motivated. Right? You don't have to tell them, go work away on this prize or send me a timesheet. They'll just do the work because they are motivated for whatever reason to work on the prize on your behalf. And they're trying to, of course, win the, the competition. Um, you'll see solution submissions. You'll test and evaluate the submissions based on the criteria set up beforehand. And then in the end, you pay for performance. Right, instead of paying for performance. And this paying for performance ex post is very different for paying for effort, which you do in most, most settings. And this, again, is a shift in how we sort of think about the various ways in which we may organize innovation. So as I was saying, you know, contests have been around for long periods of time. You know, the, the, the Duomo in Florence got developed through a contest all the way to the invention of food canning. Um, and today, with the internet, uh, we've seen you know, various different institutions take hold and also try to solve problems in this way. So you've all heard the XPRIZE Foundation, what they did, they basically kick-started you know, the commercial space industry, which, which you know, earlier this year we saw you know, uh, uh, the, the Dragon vehicle uh, from SpaceX take, o take over. And that's because somebody said, we can actually build a vehicle to go into space twice, and basically a whole set of new entrants showed up to solve the problem. Them. You've all heard of the Netflix prize, of course. Um, and then my favorite these days is Local Motors, a company, um, um, uh, actually one of our alums from HBS, that basically designs and builds cars through contests. So full-fledged cars and vehicles are being done through a contest-based mechanism. Um, I'll give you an example of what we've done at the medical school at Harvard to solve these problems and just to sort of show you this extreme value results that we've sort of seen. We took a, a, a classic problem in academia uh, around immunomics and genomics and trying to basically sequence genomes. I won't give you all the details because I don't understand them myself. Um, I just took biology in first year uh, undergrad and that was it. 
but this was a, an important problem that we were trying to solve. So we set up a, we, we used the Top Coder platform to attract people to solve this problem, and we set a, a two-week deadline and a prize pool of six thousand um, dollars. And here's what we discovered. So we found extreme value answers rapidly, uh, but this, the, the scale and scope were, were, were quite spectacular. Uh, so in a two-week period of time, we had 122 coders submit 654 solutions to the problem at hand. Uh, the co coders exceeded the performance metrics that we set by orders of magnitude. Um, we also discovered 89 different approaches to solve the problem than what existed in the state of the art. Uh, winners came from Russia, France, Belgium, U.S., and Egypt. People that the folks at the medical school would never know existed and would never be able to hire both ex ante and ex post. Um, and we were basically able to annotate uh, se gene sequences at the order of basically uh, 10 million sequences in less than three minutes um, or quarter billion sequences in less than an hour on a laptop. All right, so we basically moved the needle significantly. And graphically, this looks um, like this. So, on the x-axis, we have time, so you want to be faster, time to process, you know, 100,000 sequences. And then this is the score, how accurate the, the, the sequences were. This is the NIH Megablast algorithm that's been around for 10 years, being developed in academia, okay? This is right here, uh, the code developed by the, the researcher who gave us the answer, uh, and gave us a problem to solve. And here's a cluster of, of solutions that came in and basically blew away both in terms of accuracy as well as time what could be done with this code. This is log scale, okay? So it's, it's you know, again, orders of magnitude better performance. Now also, it's not just one extreme value, right? We have like 19 solutions that went way above uh, what one, so it's not a lucky shot. Basically, people came in and basically were able to blow away what was established within the academic world in terms of what to do with, with these types of, uh, of, of settings. And so what you'll see and hear from Jeff uh, and also from the XPRIZE folks is going to be that oftentimes you see these orders of magnitude improvements in performance when you set up these types of prize systems. Um, I'm going to actually, how much, I'm going to actually skip through um, most of these slides and just show you uh, some, some key findings um, around um, what, when we've done research on uh, prizes, what happens. So, because I want to give a lot of time to the folks that are actually d done them themselves. So the first thing I'm going to show you is who ends up winning. That's a big question. People always ask who ends up winning in these prize competitions. And what we find is that there's two characteristics. The first is you want a broad base of solvers that are highly heterogeneous, okay? You want people that are not just um, experts in the problem domain, you want people from a whole variety of problem domains participating in the problem. And so this is data from our incentive analysis, uh, and what we, what we found is that the, the more uh, diverse the solver pool is of competing solvers, the more likely you get a winning solution. Uh, and secondly, what we find is that the winners end up being people that are outside of the domains of expertise um, and uh, uh, of the problem itself. So basically, it's a chemist solving a computer science problem. And number two is very good too. This was, I did not anticipate, which was that we found, much to the chagrin of you know, our former president at Harvard, Larry Summers, uh, that women scientists did better than male scientists in our data. Um, and the reason was that basically, um, uh, uh, two things. One is that the review is completely blind, so you have no idea who's actually su submitting a solution, uh, and that actually helps quite a bit. And secondly, uh, and we know that there is a lot of gender discrimination in the natural sciences, so women get pushed out of uh, power, uh, uh, figures of authority and power within the natural sciences. There's a lot of talented women outside who can participate in these types of settings. But secondly, from behavioral economics, we know that men are overconfident. And so men will say, oh yeah, I got a shot at this, I can solve it for sure. So they, they, they over, they're overrepresented, and women, when they enter, do much better. Aman, you had a question. Yeah, um, you started off kind of, you know, with a little bit of history going back 15 years. Can you uh, help us understand in the, in the context of the research where this is in terms of quantifying um, these kinds of metrics? Yeah. You know, was this, uh, you know, some of the first attempts to quantify what happens in this? So can you give us a kind oh, of sure, yeah, thanks. research? Yeah, I've been doing it for so long that I just sort of take it for granted. Um, so yeah, I've been, I've been setting prize-based competitions in two ways. One has been through archival data analysis, so primarily working with um, Innocentive, which is an offshoot of Lilly that takes, uh, takes science problems and gets them solved. 
So part of my research was to examine the first five years of their of the platform, and we looked at all the challenges they, they posted. And um, our, this study is based on 200 about 165 challenges and 12,000 solvers participating. Um, and then uh, I've done a lot of work with the folks at Top Coder, uh, which takes the, the, this approach and applies it to software development as well. Uh, and I'll show you some data from there as well. So this is empirical data from those settings to help us understand the mechanisms behind this. Now I've moved into actually with our NASA work to actually uh, doing um, field experiments where we're actually trying to really understand the mechanisms in which the get is set in place when we're running uh, contests. So there we're trying to systematically vary prizes, prize types, um, information regimes, and so on to help us really understand what the best way to design a contest is. So this is data from archival analysis, and we're right now our lab is trying to do a whole bunch of experiments to actually build out the empirical science behind this as well. Yes. Um, Anisha Shah from AQS. Curious, uh, you know, if if you still see the same types of uh, results for um, areas of study where it requires some sort of do you, do you find that it requires um, deep technical expertise? In yeah, so that's a great question. So I, I think. Uh, so the, of course you need technical expertise, but which technical expertise to apply is the question. So oftentimes what happens is we think, well, this is the chemistry problem, so we should get chemists to solve this problem. And the first lessons that Innocentive had was, no, 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 you actually want people that are not just chemists participating because they'll look at the problem in a very different way and can actually solve it. And one of our biggest lessons has been and I'm not sure if Hila is here. No, she's not. Uh, Hila is one of my doctoral students, and she spent a lot of time at NASA looking at how they do prize challenges, is uh, problem abstraction. How do you abstract out the problem from its field? So the genomics problem I showed you, we didn't post that as a genomics problem. It, it was posed as a mathematical problem. So we did an abstraction of the problem outside of all the, de the gory details of ACTGs and VDGs and VDJs and that kind of stuff and made it a mathematical problem, and that's what did it. And many of the platforms that exist and the lessons that we're learning from our work with NASA is that abstraction becomes a, a major skill. Uh, and once you abstract, then people with other technical expertise can solve it. So it's not that you know, the common person on the street can solve it, unless they have some, some great expertise. But it's more the abstraction opens up the problem to many, pro uh, many solvers, and that helps to solve the problem. Yes? Question about the solvers themselves. Once they've done it one time, do they want to do it again? Do they still propagate? Do they breed, so to speak? Great, great question. Uh, and I think we'll, we'll see some examples, and we can, we'll have some of the solvers here as well to talk about this. Um, and what we find is that uh, depending on the platform and the types of problems you're posting, there may be uh, repeat, uh, repeat uh, winners, but also uh, people that sh keep showing up for, from different ways. So on the incentive platform, what happens is that the sheer diversity of problems they post are so different that we rarely see repeat winners. We see some, but not as many. Um, on the top coder platform, you know, the algorithmic problems uh, tend to be, require algorithmic skills, and there we actually see some people that are just extremely good and keep showing up and, and, and keep winning over and over. Yeah, yeah, so the platforms are growing, you know, you know top coder is 400,000 members, in a center is 300,000 members, and we've yet to see any kind of a drop off. We had the same questions about open source communities, you know, again, 15 years ago. People said, well, that's just a flash in the pan. This won't sustain itself. But I think what's happening is that, that, the, uh, that there's just so much skill and talent in the world. And if you provide an avenue for people to participate, if you expose the problems to participate, then they, they will show up and they'll keep participating. Yes, sir. Uh, Dave, what's up? I, I'm, uh, two questions, maybe. One is the idea that uh, the smartest people don't work for us. Is it the smartest people or is it the right people? Can you tell the difference? Again? Yeah, good question. And, and the other one is around the uh, different sectors. Yes. Uh, is, it, is it that the, you people, like a, an individual happens to have the right sector or is there some kind of cross fertilization that's happening across sectors? And have you found challenge structures that encourage the cross fertilization? Collaboration. Yeah, so I think, um, so on, on the, the, the Joy's Law remark is a big glib, right? Um, because you do have smart people working in organizations, but what happens is when it comes to innovation, the nature of the problem keeps changing. We're doing new things. And so what that hap when that happens is that as, you, as you're going after new territory, the skill sets that they may have 
may not be applicable, and somebody outside may have those answers. So it's not, I don't think it's a matter of like, you know, HR departments are, are actively trying to hire the dumb people. That's not the case. It's just that what's going on is that the, that the fundamental nature of the innovation problems keep changing for us. And then the skill sets that we thought were useful for us in time, time t are very different from the time t plus one or t plus two. And so, so that this basically says we need to be open to the fact that other people may be able to solve this problem for us and not just the folks within our organization. Um, on the cross-fertilization thing, this ha you know, in a contest setting, you know, there is no per se collaboration because people are competing on their own. But cross-fertilization happens because, you, because you've opened up the challenge, somebody from a different domain can look at it and say, oh, I've got an answer for you that you may not have thought about. Um, and so this is a, a pure competition model. Now within contest, we all, we've also seen institutions show up which allow for teamwork and so on. I'm not, that's like advanced topics, so I'm not gonna go there right now. Uh, but, but fundamentally a, comp a competition, a contest is putting into place competition where people are competing to solve. So you'll rarely see people share their knowledge unless you set up an institution that allows them to do that, which Netflix did. Netflix did that we'll, we will give you you know, um, uh, uh, milestone prizes, and if you accept the milestone prize, you must reveal your code to everybody else, and that cross-fertilizes things. But the fundamental nature is competition. Um, and what you see here on this slide is what we found from our NSM data is that most people bring knowledge they already have in their back pockets. So it's not sort of de novo problem solving, they already have a deep understanding of a, of a problem or a solution domain, and they can apply it to your setting. Um, the other question uh, people have is how many people should enter uh, a contest? Um, so here's, uh, that's, that's a big question because we have to sort of think about the incentives for why people might participate. Here, uh, an example of top coder, top coder basically drives software development through contests. They'll take a large piece of software, uh, component that needs to be built, they'll chop it up into different components and they'll run contests on all aspects of the, of the software development process. Um, you know, very global footprint. Here's a challenge that they ran for a financial services company uh, to build a, a sort of a, a, a consumer-facing uh, um, front end, um, and they had 122 people from around the world participate and solve the problem. Uh, what we have found is that you have to actually think about this uh, from two perspectives. One is that uh, from a sponsor point of view, right, you want extreme value and you want lots of people participating. Uh, but from, uh, from a solver point of view, you actually want fewer people participating because as more people participate, your incentives will drop, right? You'll say, you know, in a contest with 10 people, right, I have a 10% chance of winning. In a contest of 100, 100 people, I have a 1% chance of winning. What should, what should we do? And what we found is that, in fact, using top coder, uh, using data from, uh, from top coder, what we found is that there is a, a negative uh, effect of increasing competition. So performance does drop. Uh, as you add more competition. But that only applies to the simpler problems, okay? So for simpler problems, you wanna limit competition. Uh, but for more complex problems, which is, which is the types that we see here, you actually wanna imp open up competition and we don't see this negative effect of, um, uh, that, 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 that I discussed. Okay, I'm gonna end here with motivations to participate and then we'll go uh, to the XPRIZE folks. People often say like, why are people participating? What's going on? The first thing we see is that uh, people report across the board that the process is highly creative. They participate because they feel creative doing the work. Um, the second thing we see is that uh, people say that it's fun. It solves a need for them perhaps. They have the knowledge base and they get autonomy. They get to pick and choose what they get to work on. This autonomy is the biggest driver here in what happens. Um, and increasing knowledge, ben uh, knowledge is, is the biggest benefit that in individuals report when they participate in these contests. Um, they volunteer significant amounts of time uh, and, 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 and do the work without expectation that they will win. Right? Most people, if you think about it, are losing in a contest. Right? There's only one winner, rest are losing. So there's gotta be a whole bunch of other reasons for participation and not just the prize money. Um, and most of them are professionals, so they're, in, they're technical experts in other domains that show up to the problem and try to solve it for you. Uh, you know, it tends to be uh, a strong identification with the contest community, with the contest that's been set up, uh, a global effort, and they tend to be driven by peers. So I'll stop here, and then I'll get Chris Frangioni to come talk about uh, what the X Prize has done, um, and then uh, we'll go from there. Thanks very much.